have everyone uh, gather in and join us. Um, we are going to kick off today's webinar um, for the Community Foundations for Clean Energy Initiative. The um, disclaimer right now for those of you who have joined CMF webinars in the past, on this one you are not on mute. So please press that button on your phones now if you can so that we, we can reduce background noise as we are recording this so people can um, refer back to the conversations um, later on. Um, so I'll give everyone a second to do that now. And please do not put us on hold either as we will hear your lovely hold music. And I cannot mute you on this end on that um, with that because we can't detect who it is. All right. So welcome everyone. This is Andrea Judd. I am the Program Coordinator for the Council of Michigan Foundations. And I'd like to, uh, to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have a great group of presenters um, to offer you advice as you are um, preparing your RFP for the Community Foundations for Clean Energy Initiative. Um, just uh, a few logistics items as we are getting ready for today. As I mentioned, you are not on mute, so please mute yourself on the um, other end so we uh, don't get that background noise. Please. Um, use the chat box on the lower left hand side if you have any logistics questions and also if you um, have some questions and uh, you don't feel comfortable or you can't take yourself off mute. Uh, but we do want to encourage you to um, participate in dialogue. So to do that, um, what I'm going to ask you to do today is there's a few options. On the chat side of your screen you will see a, a raise hand button. Um, if you click that button, what it will do is it will uh, alert myself and the other presenters that you have your, a question and you would like to be called upon. When you raise your hand, we will call on you. Um, and then we'll you know, ask you to take yourself off mute, ask your question, and then um, we'll go around and do that um, to kind of get everyone's questions answered. If you are not on the webinar platform, um, and cannot see that, we will um, have uh, a few opportunities where um, people can jump in. Uh, we just know that this is a, a little easier for people who um, you know, might not be as comfortable jumping right in with a question, and that way we can get to everyone today. Um, and just before we get things kicked off, I would like to do very, very quick um, interjections just so we know who is here. Um, so I'll call upon some community foundations that I know have some people registered, and then if anyone who is from that community can just quickly say, hi, my name is, and um, that way we'll be able to get, uh, hear your voice and um, know that you're on the other end. Um, so we have um, Marquette County. Uh, Carl Lindquist, I, representing the Marquette County uh, Community Foundation. Gail said she would be joining. Okay. Thank you. Um, Grant Travers. Hi, this is uh, David Mangabeer, and I'm actually with Consumers Energy today, but I'm the incoming executive director of the Grand Travers Regional Community Foundation. I'm kind of sitting in for Phil Ella today. And also with me are Sarna Saltzman from Seeds and Dan Wirth from Groundworks for Resilient Communities. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Petoskey Harbor Springs. Hi, this is. Sarah Ford uh, from the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation. Thank you, Sarah. And we have uh, m, m Okay, there might be a few. Well, oh, I'm not from I'm oh. not from the Marinette. My name is Cheryl Dietrich, and I'm not from the Marinette Menominee Community Foundation, but I'm um, I'm I'm with NewCap for the Community Action Agency that serves the area. Um, and we manage the area weatherization program, so helping folks who are low income ener um, have energy efficient homes. And um, I'm, I thought there would be more from Marinette Menominee, but I'm here. Okay, they might just be a few minutes late joining, so thank you for joining us. Uh, Midland? Melissa, are you there? 
you might be on mute. I do see you. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll come back uh, to that. And uh, Charlevoix, I heard Maureen. And do you see Melissa posted in the chat? She is here. And uh, I know Maureen was on. Uh, might be on mute. So we'll uh, circle back on that. And then um, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. Hi, this is Tom Lywoody from the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan in Detroit. Hi, Tom. And Keweenaw. Hi, this is Melissa Davis, and uh, I'm with a local nonprofit up here called New Power Tour. But I was pausing because I'm figuring that Jim Vivian from the Keweenaw Community Foundation is also around here somewhere. We're not in the same location. Okay. Uh, you might just be dialing in or on mute. Um, so, all right. And, and anyone else that's joining us who I missed? Um, this is Maureen again. Hi, I took myself off mute. And I have a question. Am I supposed to be seeing something on my computer right now? Uh, yes, you should see a slide. I don't see a slide. Okay, I will, set, I will uh, shoot you a quick email, Maureen, and I'll get you the link so you can get um, access to that. Thank you. All right. Okay. So um, before we jump in, and I know others might have joined, but um, we will see you on the um, participant list. So um, please just, uh, like I said, raise your hand if you have a question, and um, use that chat box if you need to reach me for anything. Um, but before I turn it over to Q&A, uh, just a few reminders. Um, if you are on the webinar, you will see the initiative dates up on our screen. Um, some deadlines to look out for. The RFP is due on October 6th. We will have another one of these webinars on September 15th. And the technical assistance applications um, are due on August 18th, and you have um, until September 29th to complete those. We do have on our website a uh, number of resources that you can access um, regarding stories from community foundations, sample outcomes and metrics, and uh, videos from our previous webinar, which, um, and this webinar will also be posted there when we get the recording edited. So we do hope you will check that out. And it, that is under grant programs. Uh, the, and if you just search clean energy on our website, um, you will be able to access that, and that's at michiganfoundations.org. Regarding the technical assistance, um, we do have s assistance available um, to do a number of different projects. There's a, s a small number of hours, and you can work with our um, clean energy experts or community leadership experts um, to complete things such as introducing clean energy approaches and practices, identifying um, action opportunities, um, finding data and analyzing that uh, for your local situation, um, or working with your board or community members on community le leadership concepts. So again, those are due on the 18th. We are asking that projects be completed by September 29th, um, so we hope you will consider um, doing some work on that. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Janet Sapolsky from um, Aspen CSG to facilitate this webinar. Great. Thanks, Andrea. This is Janet Topolsky in, uh, sitting in Washington, D.C. at the Aspen Institute. And as many of you know, or for, th for those of you who don't, we are working together, our group, the Community Strategies Group of the Aspen Institute, together with Patrice Martin, whose photo you also, lovely photo you also see on the screen, from Innovative Community Solutions in Michigan. We're working together to uh, assist the Council of Michigan Foundations to coordinate all of the sort of exploration activity in relation to this initiative and, and the RFP process. So um, that's why we're on the webinar. And also, uh, although his photo is not up there, is my colleague Travis Green, uh, program manager here at Aspen CSG, who many of you have met. Travis, do you at least want to say hey? Say hello, Travis. Hi, 
Hey, everyone. <laughs> so he's there. Next time, I'm going to make sure his photo's up here, too. So what I'm going to do is just sort of uh, introduce who's available, and we do not have a program or presentation for this webinar. This webinar is about hearing your questions and having us address them, and addressing them whether they have to do with the potential initiative, whether they have to do with the RFP, whether they have to do with um, energy, clean energy, questions you have about uh, energy, um, strat clean energy strategies. So we have clean energy experts, we have community foundation experts, and we have people who have been working with the Mott Foundation and CMF on the design of the initiative. So um, by the way, I notice, I I'm just double checking here that you've noticed, Andrew, that Ellen Geisler is mentioning that some people are having trouble hearing. Yeah. So I want to make sure, I okay, so you're addressing that. Yep. Okay, great. All right, so who do we have? Uh, we have Patrice Martin, who I mentioned is, is our, our colleague in working on coordinating this with CMF. And Patrice is Vice President of Innovative Community Solutions, which is a, um, a group in Michigan that is doing work in the fields of community and economic development, building collaborative relationships with community and private foundations and other entities in the local level. And she's been working all across Michigan for quite some time and has actually has been part of the consulting services network that has been working with community foundations and other types of foundations through CMF, the Council of Michigan Foundations, for quite some time. And it's a, a joy and pleasure to work with her. Um, we have from Five Lakes Energy, I'm going to start with Laura Sherman, who is a senior consultant there. And she, uh, one of her expertises is wind, and or two, I would say, wind and other clean energy sources and business sustainability. Now, she used to work as a policy advisor for one of your um, state senators. Or wait, was that a national senator? Uh, yes, uh, from yeah, I just senator realized from that. Colorado. Yeah, national Senate. senator. So, I was just assuming it was a state senator, and I said, "Wait, no, this is this is from Colorado, so national senator." Okay, great. And um, so she's with Five Lakes Energy. Also with Five Lakes Energy, we have David Gard, who some of you met because when we did the informational session back in May in Mackinac City, he represented Five Lakes Energy there. Uh, he's been with the Michigan Environmental Council for more than a decade. He actually directed a project down in Ohio in Oberlin with an effort to um, build a resilient low-carbon community in northern Ohio. So he's he's done the work on the ground, but he's now at Five Lakes Energy. And he's also the board president of Michigan Energy Options, which makes it quite wonderful here because all in the family, we also have John Kinch on the line from Michigan Energy Options. And, and Michigan Energy Options really sort of emphasizes innovative and collaborative projects between the public and private sector that's focused on among other things, clean energy and sustainable energy. So all, I'm also proud to say that all three of these experts, and Patrice, actually, I'm not sure, but I certainly know when it comes to our energy experts, they all have deep experience and relationships with both the University of Michigan and Michigan State University, and I'm a graduate of both. So I'm very happy to have them on as colleagues. So with that, we can enter our question and answer period. So we just want to start now hearing any questions that you have, and uh, and we're just going to address them as they come. Okay, so any who would like to go first, you can raise your hand up in the upper uh, web corner, and w we'll call on you and then unmute yourself and just pose your question, and then we're going to start answering. Who wants to go first? Hello? <laughs> Cheryl Dietrich, I think, may have a question. No, I don't. I didn't raise my hand or anything. I'm just sitting here listening. This is my first time in on the call and in the, in the project, and we were just invited in. So I'm just I'm, I'm listening, trying to figure out where we fit in all this. Okay. Have you looked at all the materials online yet? No, um, Paul is uh, just our community foundation executive director. Um, sent me everything earlier this week, and I'm I'm just now getting up to speed on the process. I know they've been doing this for some time now. In fact, I believe okay. our community foundation got a technical 
assistance grant. Okay, great. Uh, Sarah Ford has her hand raised. So, Sarah, why don't you uh, tell us what your question is and remind everyone when you come on which foundation you're with. Thanks, Janet. Um, hi, this is Sarah Ford from the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation in northern Michigan. And um, one of the things that we've been uh, considering and have had uh, several conversations with the city of Petoskey, um, they've had uh, several presentations at the city council meeting, and the city council has given the uh, city manager the directive to pursue potential grant funding um, so that the city can develop a sustainability plan. Um, we've had several conversations with them and are interested in working with the city of Petoskey. There's a lot of momentum around um, sustainability and clean energy, and uh, so it seems like a um, likely yes. partner. Um, one of the questions I have is how and if and how um, a sustainability plan would potentially fit into this initiative or not. So you mean a city sustainability plan? A citywide sustainability plan, yes. Apart yeah, of I, which I mean, the uh, trans, uh, transition to more renewable energy sources, but there would be other elements included in that sustainability plan, as you can imagine. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I, I'm going to suggest that some of our energy experts might want to mention some ways they've seen this work in the past. But I would say that I mean, when it comes to filling out the RFP, if you if you've had discussions, by the way, somebody has not put themselves on mute because we're hearing other voices in the background. So please just double check that, everybody that uh, when you're doing the RFP, it, you know, if you've had discussions with the city and you have some sense of their interest in working with you, whether it's focused yet on something specific or whether it's sort of an, an agreement um, to work together, uh, that that's something that you would put on the RFP, you know. Sure. And you, you might have a sense of what piece of the – work you would be doing or you would be supporting and so that would that would be the the outcomes you're focused on right in other words your piece of the work would be focused on certain outcomes whereas as you said if it's a citywide plan there might be a set of other outcomes they're focused on that aren't necessarily uh the ones that this effort would be supporting uh, that's Correct. just off the um, top of my head I'm sorry. that's that's helpful one of the things that i was wondering um is if helping the city develop its sustainability plan, either through, um, I guess, through some maybe some sort of grant funding that we could provide from this initiative, would be something that would um, fit within the. It would in my book. I don't see why not. What uh, John, David, Laura, Patrice, do you have any anything you want to add on that? Yeah, this is David Gard. I would add, um, I agree with Janet, and I think with energy, the, the good thing is that energy touches just about every aspect of what we do in, the, in our communities and the economy. And so um, I think one of the things with a community sustainability plan you want to also do on the front end is really try to figure out a mechanism for getting a lot of input from people in the community to find out what their priorities are. And that's what leads different sustainability plans to be very unique and place-based. And so they all, I think, share some common themes, but you'll find a range of you know, different priorities that people emphasize. And so you want to definitely get a sense for that um, because you want to speak to people's interests. And the other benefit there is that you've got local champions all over on a lot of issues, and you want to give them, you know, identify them and pull them out and empower them to help pull you in the, right, in the same direction of where they already want to go and they already be working towards. The other thing I would say for sustainability plans, if you use the frame of like the triple bottom line that you're all probably familiar with, mm -hmm. environment, economy, um, kind of the social um, basket equity, of equity uh, energy can hit all of those. And so you can use it mm -hmm. to, to kind of frame, frame whatever the energy issue is to what people are most concerned about with the triple bottom line. So for instance, if people in your community really want a carbon reduction plan, it's very easy to connect energy initiatives to that on the environmental side. For the economy, if you want to really focus on developing a resilient community, um, a resilient economy where like a place based, one of the things you can do is, you know, for instance, an energy efficiency program where you can take the 
the savings of money that you get from whatever sector you're working in and redirect that money towards other things, maybe not necessarily in the energy realm, but, but something else that supports activities along the sustainability plan. And then for the social element, just one example is energy efficiency in the low-income community can really help address health and safety issues in uh, low-income housing. Thank you, David. That's very helpful. John, Laura, Patrice, anything else you want to add to that? Hi, this is John Kinch. A couple of thoughts on this. Um, you know, the local jurisdictions, local units of government have you know, mechanisms to advance policy. One of those ways you can use a climate or a sustainability plan is to get that into a commission, for example, which could be a, a volunteer made up of residents, such as a planning commission or environmental commission. And those commissions then in turn end up advising city council on policy. So what I would say is that um, there's any number of ways you can kind of introduce the beginnings of a sustainability plan into how local governments make decisions. That'd be one of them. Another one would be working with the um, master plan or even um, capital improvement plans that uh, various um, cities need to go through with their own municipal buildings. Again, keeping an eye on energy savings, uh, opportunities to invest in renewable energy. And as David said, you, know, you can have as a, um, the, the, the common denominator among all this, such things as carbon reduction or any number of other metrics. So absolutely, a, a sustainability plan is a good idea to begin to uh, move forward in a community. Right, and in fact, it's really hard for a whole community transition without a shared plan. So, I mean, there's a lot of arguments to be made for why that would be a good investment at the front end of something. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that thinking about what would be some small wins on the energy front besides just having uh, passed the plan. And I yes, think that, absolutely. that's something that's, you might want to keep in, keep in mind. In that's terms what we, of your, sort of the framework we're thinking of is, you know, how can we start this plan to get things started, but what is something that we could use as a small win that would demonstrate the benefits of doing this in our community? Right, right. Patrice, Laura, anything else you want to say, and then we're going to move on to someone else? I don't have anything important okay. to add. <laughs> nope, me neither. Sounds good. All right, well, so just so you know, I've got two hands raised right now, Phil Ellis and Tom Waiwoti from Southeast Michigan, Phil Ellis from, where's Phil from? Phil, well, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Tom. Just so you know, you're on deck, Tom. Phil? Hi, this is Sarna, not Phil, and I'm okay. uh, from Traverse City. That's where we're, we're at, Grand Traverse Region. Um, we were just wondering at this table how many letters of inquiry were submitted for this opportunity. So I'm going to ask Patrice to answer that. Patrice? There are a total of 14. And, and that was considered a healthy number, just so you know. So 14, you know, just absent context, it was considered a healthy number. By, uh, I would say by CMF and by MOP, wouldn't you say, Andrea? Yes, most definitely. Okay. Uh, Tom? Uh, yeah, well, I don't want to uh, clutter up this conversation, but I'd uh, like to throw in an, an additional opportunity. I'm, I'm responding to the sustainability discussion. Uh, some of the, the people on the phone may be familiar with the Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. The Funders Network has a grants program called Partners for Places, which, is exp which expressly focuses on sustainability and sustainability initiatives at the local level i.e. community foundations, and it would be uh, rather interesting to uh, couple this grant, the, the opportunity that, that uh, we're talking about today, with a, a Partners for Places grant. I think you might be able to get double mileage from it. So, for example, applying to the Funders Network for a sustainability plan and applying to this process for the energy implementation of that sustainability plan. For those who are not familiar with the Funders Network, uh, it's uh, fundersnetwork.org, and, um, uh, the, and the, the current cycle is open right now, meaning that uh, they are taking applications uh, as we speak. Thanks, Thanks. for that, Tom. Um, 
I think it's a, a good idea, and I mean, you know, it's another way to sort of say that you're, I mean, if if any of you did that, that might be a way to say that you're already trying to leverage um, some of the activity in another exactly. way with another funder. Yeah. Right. Okay, we are looking for, uh, you know, when, when these webinars, we're looking for more questions right now, uh, which you can either put in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Uh, we set up these webinars specifically not to be presentations because presentations are already in other webinars that you can watch on your regular time. Uh, we put these together to sort of really uh, make people available to you to answer questions about energy, about your ideas, or about the RFP or TA process. So who else has a question? We have a lot of people on the phone. Someone's thinking something. Hello? Anybody? You 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 punch the raise your hand uh thing in the participant box or you can chat uh put a question in chat. I'm concerned that people thought there was going Oh, two hands are raised. Yay, Lisa Fernstrom. Please pose your question. Take yourself off mute though, Lisa. Lisa? Lisa's disappeared from the list. Maureen Radkin. Can you hear us? Oh, we can hear you now. Lisa? Okay. It's Stan that's going to ask the question. Go ahead, Stan. Find us where you're from. Thank you. Menominee, Michigan. Great. Go ahead, Stan. All right. My question is, I guess, for Janet. Uh, has it ever been established just what uh, an entity can ask for in terms of resources in the application? Is it $300,000 or, uh, I mean, any amount that's workable to finance a plan? What, what's, what's the parameter here? Uh, it's not a matter of asking for an amount. Uh, the successful applicants, when selected, will provide, they will be provided $100,000 in grants for three years. Each year. I see. Okay. Gotcha. So, uh, so if you look at if you look at the RFP on page, uh, I think, well, it's in several places on the RFP, and this is laid out in on, in let's see on page three and four of the RFP, and you can also um, see the particulars there in the narrative questions um, on page. Eight of the RFP, which is on the website. Okay. Does Thank that clarify you. that for you? So, is it fair to say that if 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 we would come up with a proposal that looks smart and you would like, then we are eligible for a hundred thousand a year for three years? It's not that you'd be eligible for it. If it if it was accepted, you it. would be getting a hundred thousand dollars each year for three years, plus some technical okay. assistance funds and some peer learning resources as well. Okay, thank you. Cool. That was easy. Maureen Radke, you've got your hand raised. Maureen. Maureen Radke, unmute yourself. Maureen. All right, Maureen has disappeared. So we're looking for another question or a comment. You can also offer suggestions on what else would be helpful to you. Anybody? And Janet, this is this is Travis, and and perhaps I should have put my picture up there, but I did. I also wanted to continue your answer to the previous question. Go right ahead. Uh, and I I wanted to just mention that the RFP clarifies that this is a three-year and possibly renewable grant program from the Mott Foundation. So, I think this is the the first phase. It, it could be longer than three years that the foundation selected for this cohort participate uh, in this in this grant pool. Yeah, thanks for that. That's good. 
Um, so let me mention that there may be some people who are not connected to the web browser who want to ask a question. So if you do and you're not connected to the web browser, meaning you can't raise your hand, just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, please. No one? Anyone? No questions. Okay. If you're on the web browser, seriously, uh, any question, any comment? Phil, Phil, you've got your hand raised. Go, come right back. Yeah, so uh, this is actually Dave Mengebeer sitting in for Phil Ellis. And so we're, one of the reasons we haven't asked any more questions is because we're having kind of a conversation here about, uh, you know, where, where at least the Grand Traverse Regional Community Foundation and its partners uh, might want to go. And mm -hmm. I, one of the things that is uh, both kind of a, a real opportunity, but I think also a challenge with this initiative is it's so wide open. And uh, I've, you know, I've had a chance as have uh, Dan and Sarna uh, to kind of read through all this material. Um, Allison Mativa, who's actually handling this initiative for the Community Foundation here in Traverse City area. And uh, so we have some insights, but it would be really helpful, I think, uh, for people that are going to apply for technical assistance and that are going to respond formally to the RFP in October to have uh, more of a sense for what the Mott Foundation's vision is and what CMS fin fund, uh, vision is for what we want to accomplish. And uh, so, like, for example, uh, in five years from now, I realize this is a, a three-year kind of initiative, at least initially, but in five years in, from now, what would be uh, an aspiration that Mott and, um, and CMF would have uh, for this uh, initiative? Well, uh, let, me, uh, let me just address that and then invite uh, Andrew to comment on this, or Travis or Patrice from, from our conversations with them. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's a very uh, unusual question in that most often when there's an initiative like this sponsored by a national or regional foundation, the complaint is it's not flexible enough. Right, so you're asking questions, saying, <laughs> "Rein us in, right?" Or, "Don't make it so flexible. We don't know what to do." I mean, I, I actually think you probably do know what to do, but I would say that, um, you know, my sense is they're looking for, uh, and I, I think actually David mentioned this a, a few minutes ago. They're looking for multiple bottom lines, and a primary bottom line that you know, it, you won't succeed without reducing carbon emissions in some way, right? And that can be done in a variety of different ways by changing sources of energy or increasing energy efficiency, right? So they're looking for strategies that will have a significant impact in some way on uh, reducing carbon emissions. The other things they're looking for is things that are going to help, I'm going to say this straight out, poor people do better, right? And poor people or, or what I would call, um, you know, struggling businesses, you know, what, what's going to help people living in, working in, or experiencing the effects of a difficult economy do better? That can happen through energy savings. It might happen through job creation because you're creating new jobs in a renewable industry or new businesses in a renewable in industry. How does it become something that fuels uh, economic progress and prosperity for people who aren't doing well, but also for the whole economy. I'm not saying only for poor people, but without including some benefits for lower income people, that's where I think the community foundation and community leadership piece of this is most in the heart of, uh, you know, the, um, let me say this, Mod, there are two different parts of MOD involved in this. One is the energy part. I don't have the specific names for the divisions, but one's the energy part, one's the community foundation part. And it's taking leadership on this for outcomes that have to do with both of those uh, divisions in MOD. So one of them has to do with carbon reduction, one of them has to do with 
community foundation playing leadership in the economy doing better for for people um, who are suffering from you know uh, challenges in the economy so um, the triple bottom line is yes economy uh, yes energy reduction yes eco economic sort of prosperity and also equity are people on the lower end of the economic spectrum doing better because of what you've done that's what I would say, uh, you know, and it says that in all the material. It also, if you look at the draft uh, indicators and outcomes, um, makes that pretty clear. So um, I don't know if that helps at all, uh, David. Does that clarify at all for you? Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And, and by the way, when I asked my question, my colleagues pointed out I did say both challenges and opportunities, so I'm not complaining about the... <laughs> uh, you did. The broad you did. scope of this project, and, and uh, I, I think it's very exciting. So, I was you. just Good enjoying day. the ironic moment. That's all, David. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> having Janet, having been around the block a few times, go ahead. Janet, can I jump in and, and uh, oh, please continue to, to respond to David's question? This is David Gard. I've got a few thoughts, um, really related to my experience in Oberlin. I spent some time in Oberlin, Ohio, a few years back, and. You can Google something called the Oberlin Project. That's what I was affiliated with. And it was basically the small town with an ambition to become carbon neutral by 2050, and how are we going to get there? And so a lot of the work that they did before I arrived was to do a lot of community engagement. They had a lot of workshops. They pulled people into the conversation. And they identified everything you can think of across the board from transportation to waste reduction to energy to um, you, know, you name it. And you know the obvious challenge that I think they had that you share is we can't do everything, and we can't you know we have to prioritize. And so I think that is going to be a very community-specific thing. And some of the things that I know they that, that led them to their two main priorities, which I can talk about in a little bit, is first of all, what does the community already demonstrate that they are concerned about? What are existing initiatives that maybe you can tap into that's already got some momentum and interest that can help kind of give you a, a tailwind and, um, and use some organization and resources that are already in place. And then um, another thing was to Janet's point about the economy. And Oberlin happens to be a really interesting place. It's a small town in northern Ohio, very rust belt, high unemployment, high poverty rates, um, but also surrounded by um, you know, a, a lot of uh, farmland where you know, farmers are also having trouble. And so because of all of this and this really strong desire to take, you know, help try to link the educational uh, assets in the community, the community college, the local college, you know, other kinds of the, the vocational schools down the road, how do we leverage all these to do some education and training and wrap it into a program where it's hitting on some of the sustainability priorities and in the end develop the local economy? And so the two priorities that Oberlin ended up focusing on, one was energy, but more specifically, a lot of old housing stock that had to be upgraded. And so there was an effort. It was kind of a thousand homes I think we wanted to renovate. And so just you know, insulation and air sealing of old homes. And there was a lot of housing stock and just figuring out the nuts and bolts of how do you do that. They had an energy advocate that they came up with. It was a program with the local municipal utility um, in partnership with them where this, this individual really trusted person in the community could go door to door and to different community events and really get a lot of uh, buy-in from people to do these programs and a lot of focus on low-income housing. And then the other main initiative was to basically build up a local food economy where there hadn't been one. And that gets to try to utilize the, the local farmland and you know, what's already being grown and, and value-added produce and agricultural products. So basically, you know, there was a lot of discussion about food hub, how do you aggregate the demand and also the supply sides of the food economy and do more local um, buying and sourcing. And it, it left a lot of gaps in terms of the overall vision that the community had come up with, but it was, it, it fit and it was, you know, it was like a priority of steps. So yeah, they had their grand plan, they took these two areas that they thought they could really push behind and make a lot of effort in a period of three to five years and started there. And then, um, like I think was also mentioned, they designed in some early wins and so you know, got people excited that we were actually making progress, but also helped people see the longer term vision in that you know, this is a, 
an initiative that will be ongoing. It's not going to be a five-year grant project. It's, that's just kind of the start, the kickstart to a much larger community effort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Patrice or Andrea or Travis, anything uh, you wanted to add to my basic answer there? No. This is Travis. I, I would just um, to, to maybe make your point, Janet, really explicit. And I, I could pit this is uh, again Travis. I, I'll use Sarah's example from before. So, if you were to apply to this initiative, and you were to collect that hundred thousand dollars and then pass it through to the city without the community foundation playing a central role in the community leadership effort around developing that community energy plan. I don't think that that would be a, a proposal that Mott would look fondly on. I think they want the community foundation to be playing a central role in in that in that effort. And and Sarah, I'm not saying that that was what you were proposing, but I, I just want to kind of draw some contrast there to mm -hmm. make it clear that that Mott really does want the community foundation to play a, a central role in helping these uh, communities lead community clean energy efforts. Yeah, and I'll underline that this is Janet again. That that indeed, I mean, from the the the, the part of the foundation uh, where one of the program officers is is the community of philanthropy part of the foundation. So the the hope is that this will also strengthen the community leadership muscle of that community foundation to take on other challenging and wonderful and exciting things that um, that are critical to their community. Uh, and this is go Andrea. Ahead, the the one point that I just wanted to kind of add and also underline in what um, others have indicated is one of the reasons, or, or probably the reason, that this is as open and kind of blanket statement as it is is we're not looking for the, Mott is not looking for the same proposal from every community that applies. It really is going to look and feel and function differently in every community because they know from their experience working with community foundations that every community and every community foundation is different. Um, that being said, I think Janet outlined and, and underlined some important key indicators and outcomes of what the goal is, but in terms of what you do, Please do not try and figure out or read between the lines of, you know, I, I know we all do it when we're looking at grant applications of trying to figure out what what they're trying to, you know, ask for. You know, um, it, it really is, the spirit of it really is meant to say what what's going to work in your community. And, and I want to make one other point that I think is important because Michigan is a Michigan has the blessings of many different sides of communities. And when I said significant results, I didn't mean um, simply by number, right? It's significant from your starting point. That's the way I would argue for it and think about it. So if if you're in a small community, and you think, well, we'll never reach the significance that a larger community would in terms of you know, carbon emission numbers because they have more people or they've got more this, that, and the other. Just banish that from your mind, uh, at least in my opinion, I think you should. It's significance from where you're starting, right? So I th I just want to make that point because I think it's important. Um, I think the foundation and certainly the Council of Michigan Foundations is very sensitive to the differences between rural and urban and then sort of small small city, small town, small city places. And so uh, I just want to raise that that, sense of, that that sensitivity is being considered uh, throughout this process. Uh, David, your hand is raised again. David, uh, known to us as Phil Ellis. Right. <laughs> you can refer to me either as David or Phil for the purpose mm -hmm. of this call. Okay. The, um, so here's another question I have. Is Mott uh, interested in... Uh, the community foundations leveraging other dollars in addition to the $100,000 uh, grants that would be made over a three-year period. For example, you know, tapping USDA Rural Development Funds or fund.
bonds from uh, the Michigan Agency for Energy or um, you know, other national uh, foundations that are interested in helping states move towards a cleaner energy um, commitment? Yes, yes, yes. And I would say that, I wouldn't say it's a requirement, but in year two or in three, you have to match, partially match the $100,000 you're getting. So it almost is going to require leverage. But I think the way this is uh, designed is, is meant to not sort of like rule anyone out because they don't have any match or leverage in year one, right? So um, I think that leverage is always looked upon by any foundation or any government as a big plus. And I don't know how you would probably do everything you're going to want to do without leveraging some more resources into the pot. So go for it. Gravy. Well, we're all nodding our heads here, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, good. Okay, other questions? Comments, suggestions, curiosities, confusions? Raise your hand. I'm going to play the Jeopardy music now. Maybe. <laughs> Any other thoughts? That, you know, do, do you want me to call on you? <laughs> I could. What do you think, Andrew? Should I call on a few people? Uh, you know, if people wanted to share a little bit in where they are or, you know, any thoughts that they're having, that might be useful. And let me note that uh, that uh, Andrew put the link to the Funders Network in the chat box for any of you who are looking for that. Okay, uh, Ellen Geisler, do you have a question or a comment? Gail, up in Marquette, anything you want to add, question? Hi there, this is Shirley up in Marquette. Uh -huh. And Gail had to be in a meeting, so I am just taking the best notes that I can. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much, Shirley. Thank you. John Lee, anything you want to offer? That at least you show up as John Lee on my screen. Kendra Nelson, any 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 comments or questions from you? Um, I don't think so. All right, good. Kendra, thank you for saying hello. Hi. LaShawn, is it Mabry or Mabry, LaShawn? It's Mabry. Any any questions you have? Um, no, not at this time. I'm sitting in for Adam Kingston. Oh, okay. All right. Thank so you. Take a, take a note. Good. Lisa Fernstrom? Lisa, anything? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Jan. It's Paula Vizin. We're all good here. Okay, good. Uh, Maureen Radke. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Cool. No, I don't have any questions at this point. Thank you. All right. And let's see, Melissa Davis, did we talk to Melissa Davis or Melissa Kesterson? Either one of you, anything you want to Hi add? Hi there. Which <laughs> this one? This is Melissa Davis. Is that all right? Is Melissa Kestrin also trying to talk right now? I don't know, but you, we've got you, so anything you want to ask? Um, I guess uh, I'm really happy that you're coming out with this, and um I don't have, you know, a question right now, but I thought it might be nice to tell you that um, we've been doing energy efficiency work up here for two years because our community got entered into the Georgetown University Energy Prize, and that's mm -hmm. really helped um, put the put energy on our radar. It always has been on everybody's radar because our price per kilowatt is really high yep. per kilowatt hour. So, um, um, in the in that two year period using volunteers and finding people that really need help tightening up their houses, we were able to quantify that we um, reduced our uh, municipal and um, residential electricity consumption by 13% in that two-year period. And uh, 
Also, similar reductions were noted in gas use too, but I, I need to backtrack and say we can't take credit for all of that. It just happened to be a good, um, you know, to coincide, our effort happened to coincide with our electricity rates. So we're not taking credit for all that 13%, but we did see that 13%. And I think that part of that has been a lot due to working with a lot of the people in the community and getting a really broad, you know, vertical, vertical interaction on the whole demographic instead of just like a layered one in different places. Um, and we'd like to, we'd like to really, you know, think about with our group how to continue that. And we're coming up with some ideas, but basically, I just wanted to listen to you today and see, you know, the see the parameters of this project and what your what your goals were as well. So, great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I think it'll give a, a a bunch of the other community foundations uh, hope and inspiration. So cool. Um, so, Melissa Kesterson, anything you want to add or ask? Janet, we have a note in the chat box from Melissa that her oh. mic is not working, but she's listening in to the good conversation and questions, but doesn't have any questions Okay, right now. terrific. And then we've already heard from David, and we've already heard from Sarah Ford, I think. Anything else you want to say, David, or Sarah Ford? And we've already heard from Tom. Tom, any final comments from uh, the great city of Detroit, my hometown? Well, actually, uh, one of the things that we're musing and having conversations with the city about, uh, the, the city has two programs. They uh, operate independent of each other, but they, they have the potential for complementing each, each other within this particular programmatic window. One is called Motor City Match, which focuses on the redevelopment of um, uh, uh, abandoned or uh, economically challenged uh, commercial corridors, redeveloping uh, uh, commercial areas within neighborhoods. And uh, the other one is a, a, a zero interest loan for housing rehab. That, that uh, second is uh, HUD money. And um, so uh, uh, neighborhood organizations, community development organizations working with the city are identifying people who would qualify and who can uh, rehab their houses. In the rehab case, it doesn't necessarily focus on energy. It's re literally rebuilding houses that are falling down around people who are currently occupying the houses. And in the Motor City Match case, the focus is principally on revitalizing uh, commercial corridors so that are in neighborhoods so that the residents uh, have an opportunity to take advantage of uh, the commercial opportunities that, that uh, used to exist but don't exist. And I'm trying to figure out how this program could complement or perhaps amplify and maybe even, of course, change both of those programs so that energy gets written into each of them where it, is, it currently does not, is not. Any included. ideas on that, John, David, or Laura? David, John, Laura, any ideas? You know, I don't have any thoughts coming to my mind just on the top of my head. I mean, one thing that occurs to me is in the, the rehab of the homes, the homes that are falling apart, is, you know, would there be a way to marry this, um, you know, this initiative to handle the energy piece of that, whereas the other part is handled by another pot of money. So in other words, you right. increase the overall amount of money you had because uh, this takes care of all of the energy retrofit of the, of the house. Yeah. This is, this is John Kinch. Uh, my one thought, Tom, is, and you, I think you know this initiative, the Green and Healthy Homes initiative or approach to um, right. We have it rehabilitating low income housing with the idea that just solving the energy issues in the home really aren't enough if there's issues around health and safety regarding you know, you know, asbestos or lead paint and so on and so forth. So and the challenge of that um approach is as Janet was suggesting, is there oftentimes is gap funding necessary to kind of make it all happen at once versus you know, having any number of, of various um well-intended organizations touching a house and not really kind of getting to the final holistic approach to it. Um, 
So I've thought about that with regard to the community foundations that perhaps they may in fact be able to step in with having a role where they're kind of providing some kind of a gap funding whereas utilities are going to be only focused on the, the, the low income energy efficiency gains they can they can make there in those houses because of the state law. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, can, and, you know yeah. and also community action agencies have their own limitations on what they can do. There's limitations with HUD. So it becomes kind of what the various pipelines can provide and then where those gaps are. And it would seem that if community foundation had some flexibility and some funding, that that could be very um, important in making something like that work. Right. Thank you. Right, especially because if the rehab is being done without energy efficiency, it's not going to be helpful to a lot of those residents in terms of their their family economies. And, uh, you know, one of the stories that we have in the storybook talks about uh, one of the community foundations that we profiled had a Green and Healthy Home initiative where they actually did a lot of marriage of different funding streams in order to do it all at once. So you might want to look back at that. I'm trying to remember, was that... Was that Buffalo or who was it? Do you remember, Travis or Patrice? I just can't remember off the top of my head which story it was. Mm -hmm. Both Buffalo and Iowa uh, did it. Buffalo was an official uh, Green and Healthy Homes, and Des Moines, or Dubuque rather, um, modeled a program based on Green and Healthy Homes. Mm -hmm. And one of them actually uh, worked into the deal using um, people who were in reentry from prison to become uh, rehab folks, um, which which gave them jobs, which you know a whole other thing uh, that would be considered a benefit uh, or an outcome that was, that was worthy. That was Buffalo. So you might want to look at that story and then call the woman at Buffalo who put this all together, Kira Modigliano. She did one of the webinars, um, and you could listen to that, or you could just call Kara yourself because she's, you know, they they are really pros over in Buffalo in putting together that partnership. Uh, I actually they, know Kara quite well, so yeah. Uh, so thanks. you might want to talk to her. So, um, and that goes for anyone. I mean, you know, you, you can read those stories and call the people that we're quoting because I'm sure they'd talk to you. Um, Community Foundation people that have done this work, in our experience, are all quite passionate about it, and they're, they're happy to talk to others. And as you know, the culture of Community Foundations is to uh, happily steal ideas from each other, so, so please do so. Um, David, your hand is raised again. Yep, I'm making most of this opportunity. So we've, uh, we're looking at the draft RFP, and there's a section in there on collaboration. And so just sort of a general question about kind of the funders, the Mod Foundation's perspective on, you know, scaling up the impact of um, these programs or projects by partnering uh, between among various Michigan community foundations, uh, what is the the foundation's perspective on that? And then, s sort of more pragmatically speaking, let's say that um, the Grand Traverse Regional Community Foundation uh, decided to work with uh, other foundations here, community foundations here in this part of the state. Would each of those foundations be receiving the hundred thousand dollar grant for over the three year period or how would how would that kind of partnering or collaboration be treated from a funding standpoint right so um, this has been the the topic of a lot of discussion because there were a lot of questions about this um, during the comment period on the RFP and uh, the way I would bottom line it is that the Mott Foundation as well as the Council of Michigan Foundations are quite interested in collaboration, but it's really hard at this juncture in this effort to judge, you know, collaborations um, through applications. And so it makes more sense for them at this point to have individual community foundations that want to be a lead actor in this in their communities or regions to put in separate applications. And the sense is that really in the first year of this three of of this initial three year effort, 
um, the first six months is going to be really, you know, devoted to helping you really figure out how you're going to use the resources and giving you time to plan that. I mean, you're doing some planning and exploration now, but, you, you know, to really put the put the stuff together, I think Mott knows is going to take a little more time. So maybe in the process of the foundations that are selected really doing their sort of, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do, and oh, maybe we have these neighbors interested in it too. I mean, maybe there's some natural sort of collaboration thing that will emerge because of what you've decided to do in your communities. But it seems really important that there be, as I think uh, David mentioned earlier, some engagement of your community and residents to figure out what's going to make the most sense where you are in your community before, uh, you know, and I don't mean this in any, any pejorative way, a grand collaboration has started. I mean, so let's start from the ground up and see where collaborations make sense from an efficiency standpoint, an impact standpoint, or whatever. And I think Mott's interested in being supportive of that, but it's hard to to sort of figure out at this juncture, um, you know, looking at a collaboration on a piece of paper, right? So have the individual community foundations apply and where collaborations emerge or where, you know, um, you know where you decide to do more collaboration locally is going to be, uh, what, we'll just see what emerges. Was that confusing or do you, do you get it? No, I, I think that's good. I, I would just say there, it sort of seems like a two-edged sword, right? Because if, let's say, we decided to partner with the Petoskey Harbor Springs Community Foundation, or we wanted to, and uh, we believe that, uh, you know, some kind of partnership would result in a, a more significant reduction in CO2 emissions in the state, uh, but they decided to do something completely different, right? then uh, the ability to kind of scale the project up and have a, a more significant impact is really going to be limited because we're sort of doing good things individually uh, and within our own regions or communities, but really not kind of getting the multiple effect by uh, agreeing on a, you know, a, a, a broader collaboration up front. So I, I just, I would just submit, I, I, I'm not arguing that the approach no. that CMF and the Mott Foundation is, is is proposing is wrong. I'm just saying that there is there there is another side to the coin. Right, and and I just want to acknowledge that everyone I think working on this understands that other side of the coin, but also um, wants to make sure that uh, individual community foundations are committed to this. Right. So and and it's hard once again as I said before before you really have a plan for what you're going to do it's hard to really know whether a collaboration is the way to do it. Right? It's sort of like cho it's choosing your method before you know what you're trying to do. Patrice were you about to say something? Sorry. Uh, no, not me, it was someone else. Okay. Uh, this is Maureen. Uh, I'd like to jump in when I can. Sure, Maureen, go ahead. Okay. You know, I'm just sitting here listening, and we we um, we are very early on in in our stages of developing anything, and mm -hmm. I can really see what David is saying. I mean, we we are kind of used to uh, the network we have up here, which is a very rural area um, in in northern Michigan. And I was interested in the project that involved the Community Action Agency because our Community Action Agency up here services, I'm not sure, like five or nine counties or something like that, um, a huge area. And we're all in the same one, um, Grand Traverse um, and Charlevoix and Emmett, um, where Petoskey is. We're, they serve, uh, one agency serves all of us. And mm -hmm. they are in the business of rehabbing homes. Now, I'm, and I'm, I'm not fluid in everything they do, but I know they do that, and I'm not sure if they have any energy efficiency component to it or not, though. So in this case, this is working the opposite, where the collaboration is already there because the major leading nonprofit doing that work is already doing that work. Well, I encourage you to look at question nine on the RFP, which is an optional question. Okay. 
and it says this RFP requires individual applications for foundations and or affiliates that want to participate. However, several foundations indicated in their letter of interest that they may want to collaborate during the initiative. And it just sort of then asks you if if you are thinking this makes sense, please describe the activities or aspects of the initiative for which you think collaboration will help. And then how would each activity or aspect of collaboration you describe create efficiency and or increase clean, create clean energy impact? So there's an opportunity for you to sort of like present what you think makes sense here if that's the way you want to go. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to change at this juncture, and I want to underline at this juncture, meaning year one, how MOT is likely to fund CMF to, to do, how MOT and CMF are likely to sort of uh, make their selection. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's a lot of apples and oranges in collaborations versus individual foundations. So the decision was made to start with individual foundations, but to listen to people's case for collaboration. Okay. I, I'm not sure I can say anything beyond that at this point. Uh, Andrea, Patrice, Travis, anything you want to add? Hearing um, nothing? I guess, oh, go ahead. I, I guess the, the one thing that just in terms of the thinking and, and again, you know, not not knowing exactly what the future might hold, but the dollars that are available are, you know, the dollars that are available. So if we are, you know, just knowing that a, a collaborative regional approach, um, you know, we wouldn't have the, it, it, the way it looks right now, we would not have the dollars to make, the, the matter is really looking at making the impact in these communities. and. You know, collaboration does take time, and it takes additional resources. And if there is an approach that you see that that ca could be efficient with the amount of dollars that are available, then put that in your application. But we are looking for the those individual applications from each community foundation so we can look at the impacts that would be had. Yeah, and the one other thing I would say is if you think there's there's a, a good argument for it, do some research on it now. Mm -hmm. right. Other questions? So Maureen, uh, did, uh, Maureen or David, I still have your hand raised. Did you just not turn them off, Andrea? Right. Or do you have other questions, yeah. other comments? Not at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. Not trying to tamp it, just trying to sort of start with the individual foundations and then, and you know, really focusing in their community and building up to the collaborations that make the most sense, really. Okay. Any other questions? I think I went through everyone, although, let's see, Laura Sherman, I'm not sure she's on screen. Laura, are you on the phone? Is there a question you have? Oh, no, Laura, you're there. You're there. That's right. You're on the screen. What am I saying? Too many things going on. Forgive me, Laura. Uh, no any <laughs> Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Going once or comments? Going twice or cases to be made? Going three times? All right, Andrew, I'm going to turn it back to you to close out then. All right, great. Well, thank you, Janet. Thank you to um, all of our presenters, uh, Laura, David, Patrice, John, and Travis. Um, thank you all for joining us today and providing um, your thoughts and expertise. Um, thank you to all of you that joined and are doing this work um, in your communities. And we look forward to further communication with you. It, this uh, recording will be put up on our um, initiative webpage, and that's michiganfoundations.org. It's under the Grant Programs tab and Clean Energy Grants, or you can just search green, uh, Clean Energy, and it will um, pop up in the search results. And you can